Has anyone read John Stott's book? It can't be on your shelf. You've had to have read it. You've read, so you've read it before? All of it. And not all of it. I mean, even if you started, I guess that's a reading of it. Okay, so we got two. If Anybody I did, else? I, I don't remember much. Okay. I was given, I was uh, commanded to read this book on a syllabus by one of my professors at the Bible College at Southeastern where I, where I attended. So this book has been in my life uh, since 2006. It's a timeless book. It's a book worthy of reading anything Stott writes, you know. He's got his theological idiosyncrasies I think people disagree with, but uh, the core of, of uh, what this book's about is good. So here's the illustration I kind of wrap my mind around to help me understand this book and, and preaching in general. When you're young, I mean, I think everybody played with these Lincoln Logs, right? I mean, you open the box and it's just tons of logs. And you got to begin to make sense out of this box of, of logs and you begin working these logs and putting them together. The foundation is, is key and then putting your walls up are key because these logs lock in together. And this is what Stott's doing in, in this book. He's taking the complex idea of preaching, apologetics, knowing your culture, knowing the fallen nature of man, and he's kind of putting it, putting it together in four major pillars. Preaching, content, people, and culture. Of course, preaching and content go together. People and culture go together. So the book has eight chapters. I'm going to be working down through all eight chapters. Each chapter, I think, we have content on preaching. Uh, we have meat or, or, or text on preaching, content, people, and culture. And then we'll be giving, I'll be giving application from what I see coming from each chapter for open-air preachers. Because the book is designed toward pastors. But we are, most of us, well, all of us in this room are open-air preachers, so I thought application directly related to open-air preaching is be very, very important. I've got scripture here in front of me, so I'm going to be using some scripture. It probably won't be, per se, going in a book physically because I have it all typed up. But um, here we go. So remember the, the, the major things you have to remember is preaching, content, people, and culture because we're going to be dealing with it in every single chapter. So chapter one is the glory of preaching and the historical sketch of preaching. And this is maybe kind of where you lost, lost a little bit of your momentum because he, he uh, does go into a lot of detail about the his, history, the historical sketch of preaching. So preaching and teaching the word is our major task as an evangelist. And here's one of his quotes from Luther. Since the health of Christians... And the church depends on the Word of God. The preaching and teaching is both the most important part of our divine service. Preaching the Word is serving this great God. Uh, another quote he has in that chapter is, Preaching should rank as the noblest work on earth. And guys, don't forget that. When you're there and that, little, that, that guy's cussing you out or you got somebody yelling at you, you're doing the most noble task that anybody can do. You are sharing the Word of God that can take a soul from darkness to life, from death, I mean, from darkness to light, from death to life, okay? So the, that, that's the preacher preaching heading under chapter 1, and the content that we should give in our preaching from chapter 1, the great design and intention of the often office of the Christian preacher is to restore the throne and the dominion of God in the souls of men. Okay, so as... As you're there, we don't want uh, your, your preaching or I don't want my preaching just to be a sounding gong. I want to be taking a soul, snatching it from the kingdom of hell into the kingdom of God. And that's what we're doing. We're doing kingdom work. When you're reasoning, when you're sharing, when you're preaching, when you're on fire, as Lloyd-Jones said, and when you're logic on fire, you're drawing people into the kingdom of God. You're shutting mouths with the law of God. Uh, the people, the content, uh, the pillar number three, the pulpit will still remain the grand means of affecting the masses of men. This is written by a guy named Alexandria in his book, pages 9 through 10. He, he has really good footnotes, but sometimes I, I think he falls a little short. Uh, here it is. I mean, so that the people that you're preaching to, God is using preaching 
to draw these people in. And we can love them to death. We can cut their grass for them. We can do bake sales. We can do all these great things. But until they hear the Word of God, they're never going to be converted. Until they hear the Word of God shared or preached or proclaimed, they're never, ever going to come into the kingdom. So the culture that we're going to be dealing with from chapter 1, the preacher who is the messenger of God is the real master of society. Not elected by society to be its ruler, but elected by God to form its ideals through them to guide and rule its life. Now, I'll quote that again. We're not elected by society or by rulers, but we're elected by God to form its ideals and through them to guide its rule of life. So the preacher is elected by God to change its culture. The preacher is elected by God to go into its... You're, you're, you're the preacher who is to go into your area of the harvest field and to proclaim a kingdom that's come to see that soul saved from the kingdom of hell and brought into the kingdom of God. Some of the scriptures that, that I want to just encourage you with, Matthew 5.13, you are salt of the earth. Matthew 5.14, you are the light to the world. Don't forget that, guys. Application point we took, we're taking away from this chapter. Our task at hand is, to, is a weighty task, and it should not be taken lightly. With all these light Christian preachers, these false teachers that are out there today, the celebrity pulpits across the land, the Stephen Furtick's, the Joel Osteen's, the Bethel churches, God has called us to stand in the gap for such a time as this. So we are to do it. And one thing that I have been hesitating to do for many, many years because I've been pr praying through how to do this well is to call out these false teachers. I think it's time for men who are grounded in the Word of God to call these men out. And I know there, there are preachers doing it already, like Tony Miano and, and other brothers. But I think it's time for us to stand and go, okay, this is why this guy is a false teacher. Not just say it, but walk down through, okay, this is this guy's false doctrine. I mean, Stephen Furtick has his Sunday school, his kids in Sunday school drawing pictures of him and taking Romans 13 out of context of worshiping him rather than submitting to the local government. So this is the type of horrific stuff that's going on within these churches that I think we need to start doing a better task at calling these men to the carpet on. All right, so that's chapter 1. Chapter 2, contemporary objection to the preaching. Okay, so there, once again, we got our four pillars, preaching, content, people, and culture. In this one, we're going to deal first and foremost with people. He goes to the very beginning talking about the fall has brought about the rebellion that we see in our culture today, and they're, they're unable to submit to God's law. He tells us that in page 51. Guys, we see it every single day when we go out in the street. These, these men are not going to love God. These women are not going to love God. When you see them at the clinic, if any of you do work at the abortion mill, these women and men, they are not seeking God. They're seeking their own pleasures, and they're seeking their own selfish desires and their gains. Here's a voice from the culture. Charlie White from the Rolling Stones drummer. This was written back in The Guardian in October 9, 1967, which is about the time this book came out. So this was a, a, a recent a popular quote. And he says this, and he's a drummer for the Rolling Stones. I'm against any form of our, our organized thought. I'm against any organized religion like a church. I don't see how you can organize 10 million minds to believe one thing. Now, I couldn't help but laugh at that because... He's a drummer with the Rolling Stones. They have millions of people following them. They have millions of people buying their tickets. And here is a religion he is part of, the Rolling Stones. It's, a, it's a, the religion of, of the Rolling Stones. But anyway, I, I couldn't help but chuckle there a little bit. Uh, so he was really self-refuting himself. So we need to have dialogue within our preaching. We need, we need to not have monologue all the time. It doesn't need to be just thus says the Lord, but it needs to be dialogue with people and to be able to explain Christianity to him because, let me tell you, the Rolling Stones, the modern, uh, the, the college campuses, they have influenced these minds and now they're in this earth rebelling, living by their own lustful deeds and desires and it's our job to go into them and to challenge them. Uh, Stott also talks about anticipating objections. So this is what I've started doing in some of my preaching, even if it's not brought up, 
I begin bringing up common day objections. Um, it's too much evil in the world. I'll go ahead and just talk about it. Well, while, I'm, while I'm preaching, if I'm going through a specific text, and I, I think it, it, will, it, will, it will flow well with the text, I talk about evil. If I think it, it will flow well with the text of why the Scripture is the Word of God, I show why the Word of God is trustworthy. Uh, I deal with the topic of uh, I don't believe in your God, and I, I talk about why you should believe in the one true living God. And, uh, the other topic is, well, God doesn't exist. Uh, another topic you deal with a lot is humans determine right from wrong. Go ahead and talk about these objections, even if somebody's not bringing it up, because the people walking past you are already thinking about it. So, so it's our job just to go ahead and kind of kind of bring it up to start with. Uh, the next thing we'll look at under this chapter is culture. Uh, the, the older and older is giving a place to a new. This is this anti-authority uh, that, that we see. So basically the family has been eroded, the school has been eroded, the university has been eroded, the state, the church, the Bible, the Pope, so on and so forth. All this, this anti-authority is being challenged now. And so when this book was written back in the 67, uh, it's now going full bore, and we're seeing the implications of what Stott was saying about. Uh, Stott also talks about in the culture something I thought was very intriguing for me. He calls it cybernetics revolution. So he, and, and, and he goes into detail with this. He starts all the way back to the alphabet and when it was started and how that began to influence the culture. He takes us forward to 1468 when Gutenberg came about. Then he takes us forward to the telegraph. But then he really spends a lot of time talking about the computer. He says this, In the human context of mutual love and speaking and hearing the word of God is also likely to become more necessary for the preservation of humanness. So let me explain what, what I think he was trying to get at. He said society was going to become, get to such a point with the computer and with TV that they were going to become less human, that the communication of having dialogue and looking someone in the eye was going to become less and less. And he's saying that preaching is going to be the very thing that's going to anchor us in our humanness, in our ability to relate with each other, in our ability to communicate with each other. So Stott was, uh, I think, laying the groundwork, not laying the groundwork, but actually sharing with us basically what we are seeing taking place full bore here in 2018. He says the TV makes, men, uh, makes people lazy. It makes them intellectually uncritical. Uh, lazy intellectual, lazy, laziness destroys our ability to think abstractly. It's going to make us emotional insensitive. How many of us uh, see things going on in the TV, or in, especially this culture with all the evil and things that you can, you can cut on the TV and blood and gore and guts, and you become so detached from it, you know? So uh, I think that's very spot on. It's psychologically confusing us and bringing about an artificial reality. Uh, you see that going on with these gamers and this 4D thing going on with these headsets now you put on and actually you're in, you're in the game. It makes you morally disordered. Uh, you forget uh, if you're, you're so consumed by this media and this culture, you even forget, well, man, this is not, this is not right because the Lord says so in His Word. I don't care if 20 million people do it. And I'm fighting this with my kids because we, I, I let them watch TV. And we, I think it's a, a good way for us to, to look at the culture. I don't let them watch tons, but I do let them watch some. And I can see it. Well, Dad, look, she's got it on. And all the girls at school have it on. It doesn't matter, baby. God says it's dishonoring. We don't do it because God said not to do it. So uh, that's one thing. TV just makes you morally disordered. So application from this, uh, nope, excuse me, I want to go on to preaching, okay? So that's our culture. That's where we're at with this culture. Now what does what preaching look like within this contemporary objective culture? How does a preacher connect? So how can a preacher connect to the people in his world that we live in? Can we maintain our, our loyal, loyalty to historical Christian faith but at the same time Respecting and recognizing the modern mood of doubt and denial. Uh, we need to be aware with our kids how long they sit in front of the TV. We need to, and this is one thing that I think the Lord is showing me, and I have to continually uh, watch how much I do this, but 
I think Christians, we should be penetrating mass media. I mean, I think Jeff Durbin and those guys at Apologia, they're doing something, although it may, may not be great, but they're trying. They're not as, as big and have, have the production money that these big movie uh, companies have, but influencing the mass media with Christian literature and Christian content. Uh, we have a huge fight on our hands uh, in, in the media because it's, it's induced the world. You know, Scott, Scott, Scott says there's four ways that people learn. They listen, they discuss, they watch, and they discover. Let me say it again. So they listen, they discuss, they watch, and they discover. Guys, when we're open air preaching, they're engaging us with two of those ways. They're listening to us, and they're discussing with us. So I think God has designed it in such a way that us preachers we're already, at, at, at the same time, engaging in two of the four ways that people learn. By letting them listen and discuss back with us. He talks about the two canons on the Christian side. is prayer and evangelism. Okay? Our preaching, we are preaching in a culture that is lost, but also the church has lost its confidence in the gospel. And guys, it's our jobs to bring the church to a point to help the church see the confidence they should have in the gospel. And I think that comes with heralding the word, proclaiming the good word, the good word of God, uh, recovering the Christian morale. Uh, Christian scholars should be debating uh, unbelievers in this issue. I, that's why I thank God for, for what Mr. White does and what Jeff Durbin does and what Cy Tim Bruggenkate does and what Tony Miano does and what Brother Dustin Seegers do, he, he, he does. I mean, they're debating these sharp minds who have been saturated in rebellion for so many years with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be expectantly praying, expecting God to move, expecting God to work through the power of the Holy Spirit, expecting Him to pour out His grace upon us the human race, okay? And the fourth point, the content under this chapter, he went very, very long on this, so I'm just going to be, uh, to, be uh, to be brief here. So there's three major things he talks, talks well, four major things he talks about under, under the content. The nature of human beings, okay? He talks, he said, the mind is free only under the authority of truth. And and this is where he went kind of into a presuppositional mode, which I thought was very, very intriguing for me. I thought was very, very helpful. The only way somebody can truly be free is if they're submitted under authority, true authority, God's authority. Because if you're not free to submit to that true authority, all you have is subjectivism, and the next person rise up can consume you and can consume your mind. So this idea of being free, only way to be free is under authority is very, very important. Is it that authority which men at once resent and crave? I thought I, I love that phrase because men resent authority, but at the same time they crave authority. You know, that's what the Christian life is, right? It's just submission to authority. We're submitting to our God. We're saying, thus says the Lord, and we're going out and saying that. We're living. We're obeying. We're submitting to Him. And the rebellious human heart, they resent it, but at the same time they crave it all the less. He says in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 through 30, Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I'm gentle, humble in heart. You will find your rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And guys, that, that should give us great comfort because that's the nature of every, every single human being. They know that authority is there. They crave it, but at the same time, they resent it. It's our job to show them, listen, what you crave is found in the true authority, God Himself. The nature of revelation. Take courage in this, guys. Not because human beings in, in, invented, but because God revealed it. Okay? God revealed Himself to the human race. It says in 1 Corinthians 4.1, This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those who entrusted with the mysteries of God has revealed. That God has given this to us. That God has... It's a revelatory epistemology. God has revealed Himself. He's given knowledge to His creation that He is God, and every man is without excuse. Okay? And He went on to talk about the, 
the, not the locus, but the locus of authority. So the center focus, the focal point of where things are coming from. Okay? There is something inherently horrid about human beings who claim and attempt to wield personal authority they do not have. And that's what the culture is doing. They're wielding authority they don't have. God hadn't give this, given this authority to him. So really they're living in a false reality. When a man is living in rebellion, when he's living in sin, when he's unwilling to submit to God's way, when he's unwilling to submit to God's cross, when he's unwilling to submit to God's justice, he is a rebel without a cause because he has no authority. He has no right to do what he's doing because one day he's going to be held accountable. He's going to come under judgment of this great God. They're living in a false reality that's going to crumble around them in two ways. It is un, 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 they're un, unable to live it out in its extremist form. So if they say everything is subjective, this is how it's going to crumble around their feet. They can't live that out. Because if everything's subjective, and you guys know this as well as I do, the mur guy who murders children and murders people is no worse than the guy who helps people and takes care of soup kitchens. It's going to crumble around them. They can't live without. On Judgment Day, it's going to be clearly seen that this false reality is going to be judged according to God. Number four under here, the relevance of the gospel. So then it's not enough for us to make a pronouncement of authority. We have to argue the re reasonableness and demonstrate the relevance of what we declare. Then people will listen respectfully. I kind of disagree with him just a little bit on this. Without God, you don't have relevance. I don't have to prove anybody that God's relevant. He's already proven to him that he's relevant. He's given them life. He's given them breath. Okay? Some applications from this chapter. With the current, and I put this down, and we were talking about it over dinner. With the current fall of these Catholic priests, this is going to continue to fuel the fire. This is why I don't like organized religion. This is why I don't, I don't believe in God. This is why I don't believe in this or that. And it's going to be our job to confront it, to talk about it, to deal with it right out in the open and go, I don't care what some man did. I don't care what you may use now as an excuse not to believe in God. It's not a valid excuse. It's not an excuse at all. As preachers, we must know the authority of being under authority. Show biblical... Um, you guys already know this. I don't have to discuss that. Discussing and having dialogue during open-air preaching is vital, vitally important to have more here. Um, bring up their objections, answer them while they're while we're there preaching. Uh, I've done a podcast on on an acronym FIRE. If it helps you guys, you guys can go and listen. If not, don't worry about it. But so here's the acronym FIRE. The face of evil. I don't believe in God. That's the I. G. Well, I don't believe in your God. G is God doesn't exist. H is humans determine right from wrong. T is the Bible's not trustworthy. So if you can remember those five, the face of evil I don't believe in your God. God does not exist. Humans determine right from wrong. The Bible is not trustworthy. You can answer 95% of the objections that come your way. So that's just a way I memorized it. Fight. Also, another takeaway is, uh, I've already talked about that. Four ways people learn is through by, where is it at? What? Listening, discuss, watch and discover, okay? You're, already, you're doing two of the four when you're preaching, listening, and discussing, all right? That was the longest one. That was chapter two. Chapter three, theological foundations of preaching, okay? So now we're building our Lincoln Logs, right? We, we're, we, we got our four pillars, and we just, we're adding to the walls now. We're building our whole house of how to view things. The theological foundations of preaching. Uh, under preaching, we do not need to master certain techniques but we need to be mastered by certain convictions. Okay, so don't be so focused on, well, Cy did it that way, Jeff did it that way, man, uh, Jeff Roth did it that way. You worry about having convictions of your preaching. You worry about be, being passionate in your prayer room. You worry about being passionate in your prayer closet. And I'm speaking to myself also, that when we prepare ourselves and prepare our hearts, then we're ready to go out because we have conviction. We need to have convictions about God. God is light. God has acted. God has spoken. 
And God is speaking, redeeming. He's a self-revealing God. Our content that we should be giving, our convictions about the Scripture should run very deep. God's Word is given to us through human authors. The Word has spoken, and the authors, God used the authors, authors simultaneously and gave us His Word. God will speak and will continue to speak through what He's spoken. God's Word is powerful. And guys, I saw it unfold in Massachusetts. I just want to encourage you with one story. A young man named Matthew grew up in a Catholic home. God basically drew him over to our corner, and we began walking him through the Word of God. And as he went, came with a question, we gave him the Word of God. After about 20, 25 minutes, his mouth just became shut because the Word of God shut his mouth. He no longer had any excuses. And he said, he began asking, so what do I do to get saved? And I, I gave this guy every, every opportunity to get out and go away. I said, have you counted the cost? Do you know it, it's going to cost you your sin? It's going to cost you turning away from sin and following Christ. I said, do you see you've offended God and you deserve a just hell? He says, yeah, I see it. I need Christ. And it was the power of the Word of God that... that Hopefully, the young man, as I told him, I said, listen, I said, if this cry out to God is genuine, you will bear fruit proving your repentance. You will have a new nature. You will begin to love God. You will begin to hate sin. You will begin to walk in newness of life. And so believe and put your hope in the power of the Word of God, not in trickery, not in new rhetoric or, 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 or different things, but put your power and your hope in the Word of God. The conviction about the church it is indivisible connection between the church and the word, between the state and the Christian community and the quality of the Christian preacher. So why is our church, why are the church, why is the church on a whole the way it is today? Because Christian preaching has been weak. We've gotten away from the word of God. We have been beginning to tip men's ears. And that's why these Stephen Furtick's are raised up. That's why these Joel Osteens are so popular. Because on whole, the cultures turn away from the preaching of the Word of God. And it's our job to bring and to remain consistent in preaching this Word. Convictions about the pastorate, we'll just skip that. Um, we'll just go around on the application here in chapter 3. Be an expositor who preaches in the open air. That's the biggest challenge I've taken from this book. I need to take as serious as when I'm asked to preach behind a pulpit, I need to take the task of open-air preaching the Lord's text of Scripture as serious as I take hours of study to get ready to preach at a church. Never ever take the Holy Bible, and the Lord's convicting me on this, and just flip open the book and begin thumbing for it. All right, which verse, which verse, which chapter should I preach? Prepare yourself in your closet. Prepare your heart. Lord, what do you want me to preach from? What text do you want me to preach from? And then when you go, you've already been familiarized with the text. You've already prayed over the text. You've already asked the Lord to show you what's in the text. And then you can unleash it to the people. Remember, God is still at work through His Word being preached and explained. Okay, Chapter 4. Preaching is bridge building. Okay, He talked about four types of preachers. We got the heralds. We got the sores, and we got ambassadors. And really, we're all three out there. Because we're heralds saying, thus says the Lord. We're the fool, we're the idiots on the stools, right? To the world. But we're sowing seed. We are sowing. We don't know what soil is going to fall on, but sometimes the Lord may show us that picture every now and then. But we're sowing seed. And then finally, we're ambassadors. We're representatives on behalf of Christ. We're representing Him and hopefully representing Him well. Christians should be able to distinguish between truth, error, good, and evil. When you leave an area, and you have preached, and Christians have come by you, they should be better, they should be stronger in Christ because they've heard you preach. They should be better at discerning what truth is, they should be better at discerning what good error is, and what good and what evil is. The business uh, under content on this chapter, the business of preaching is relating the teaching of the Scriptures to what is happening in our day. So you've got your finger on the pulse of the culture, and you've got the other hand in the Bible. 
He challenges us to go out into segments of the world which do not acknowledge Him there and to give ourselves and witnesses to serve Him. And that's one thing I love about Stott. I, don't, I didn't know him as a man, I think. But um, I think he would definitely support it open air preaching. I think he would have. Because what you see here in his tone in, in, in this chapter is pick a spot. Go to the spot. And you preach there until God tells you to leave. And that's one thing Scott challenged me with when I first started in Raleigh. He said, Tommy, pick, pick a spot and just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep plowing. Call that, that's your corner of the harvest field and you're going to faithfully go. And what happens is when we start doing this, guys, and you've seen it unfold in your life, men become to come in our wake. And then other men begin to get faithful in that area. And then you can move on to train others. So set the example, set the, set the pre- precedent in your corner of the harvest field and God will do a work through you. So people, the people we're going to do the bridge, bridge building with. Um, biblical principles to the problems of the contemporary society. So you bring the Bible, you bring sound Christian doctor, doctrine to the transgender. You bring sound Christian doctrine to the homosexual. You bring sound Christian doctrine to social injustice. And you show the social injustice guy, listen, it's not a social injustice issue, it's a gospel issue. You need Christ. You show the homosexuality, they're going against the design of God. You show the transgender, they're going against God's design. Handle controversial questions and address it in the open air. It's not something to skirt. Let's lean into it and face it head on. So the culture. Not, okay, so this is a, on page 138, this was a conversation that he had with uh, two young atheists. He was having tea with them. And they said, Mr. Stott, we don't care really if God exists. Our big concern now these days is, is it even relevant? Okay? And I had to chuckle just a bit here too also because without God, you have no relevance. But with God, you have relevance. But without God, you have no need for relevance at all because everything is just futile and subjective. Okay? We need to expose them to the God they know exists. I know you guys heard that time and time again, but it's our, that's our job. Okay? We have to provoke them to think about their life in all moods, to challenge them to make Jesus the Lord in every area of it, and to demonstrate His contemporary relevance. Now, that, that's His words on page 147. We've already covered that. I don't think we have to do that. God is relevant because without Him, you don't have anything. Okay? Some applications for us. Without God, life does not have relevance because nothing exists and everything is meaningless. But with God, there is relevance because we do exist and there is meaning to life. Okay? We need to be about our Father's business, go to our corner of the harvest field, and remain faithful. Okay? Bring the controversial questions up in the open air. Don't skirt them. Deal with them. Lean into them. Okay? Expose error in the open form. So when you're having this dialogue, when you're, when you're giving the heckler the mic and letting him talk, go into his worldview and expose his contradictions. Let everybody else around hear it and share it out in the open form and forum of the open air. Philippians 1.9 says this, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge, in depth, and insight. So as you grow more in Christ, as you're dealing more with these popular cultural topics of rebellion against this God, your insight in in these issues are going to continue to grow. Okay? All right, chapter 5. A call to study. This is a convicting one for me. I'll be a convicting one for all of us, probably. Preaching, content, people, and culture. All right, so for our preaching, how many verses of Scripture are you memorizing per year? Are you even challenging yourself? Do you have, even have that on your radar? Okay? Because, guys, all of us have been in the open air long enough. You know you use what you have memorized. I don't have to tell you that because I do it. I have 1 Peter 3, 18 memorized, and I use it every time I go out. You use what you have memorized. If you don't have it memorized, you won't use it. And when you memorize it, practice with it. 
use it out in the open air because you'll keep using it more. The Holy Spirit has content that it can pull up to use in your preaching when you memorize it, okay? Um, also, he talks about a reading plan. Uh, this reading plan, I'm going to start using it next year. I'm, I'm using another reading plan right now. But it's called, I'll just spell the guy's name, C-H-E-Y-N-E. -E. Uh, you can get it on Bible BibleReadingPlan.org. It's basically, it has you reading in the Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms and Proverbs almost every day. And it flows um, with parallel passages through the entire Bible for 365 days a year. Very, very important that we be reading through the Word of God. You're saturating your mind with the Word of God. You're reading the Word of God at least at minimum every year. You're reading through Genesis all the way to Revelation at least once a year. Okay? Read Christian classics. So if, if we're going to be better at preaching, we need to read, read dead men who have preached before us. Okay? I'm, I'm speaking to the choir on that probably. Um, the content of your, of your time with the Lord, so the habits of your study. If you can, know the ancient text. Okay? Start, I think this is, he's, he's on to something here. I, I know for me, it with a, sometimes I can have a short attention span. He says he doesn't study any more than an hour at one time focused study. He said, give yourself an hour and then take a break. Walk away for a little bit. Give yourself an hour, then take a break and walk away a little bit. For me, uh, one thing I do that's very helpful for me if I'm studying a text or if I'm, I'm thinking about writing something or, or, or writing a curriculum to explain something to, to other men, I give myself some time doing a meaningless task. I just cut grass. Something I don't have to think about. And all of a sudden, me, what I've been writing on or thinking about, the Spirit of God sometimes just brings a new perspective and I can, I can explain it better. So give your mind some time just to relax and just to do a mindless task to allow yourself, to, for short lack of better words, just to be creative in trying to explain something. I think that's very helpful for me. Uh, he challenged us to read one hour every day. Okay? That's like eating your broccoli. If you put it on your calendar and you do it, you will be amazed at how many books you can read in one year. Just one hour a day. He gave himself... I don't know if he had kids at home when he did this, but he gave himself a quiet day every month where he did not go on any type of so, well, social media wasn't around during that time. Didn't, get, didn't watch TV, didn't answer the phone. He just simply spent time with the Lord and he read. He just had a day of just peace and quiet. He didn't answer emails. He didn't do anything like that. I think, I wish I could implement that. That would be very, very helpful. Then he gets personal hindrances to study. Laziness, busyness, and our schedules. Let me say it again. Laziness, being lazy and not wanting to get out of bed or not wanting to be disciplined to have that hour read time. Busyness, oh, I'm too busy to do this. Well, if your calendar is too busy, take something off. You have to be in control of your calendar. And that's why I love him getting so practical here and rebuking me in, in, this, in this chapter. Uh, with the people, the people that we're preaching to, you got to know your people. He's talking to pastors, but hey, you have to know the people that are walking past you. You have to know them, what, they, what they're thinking, how, what they may be wrestling with, what they may be dealing with. So know the people that are in the culture that you're preaching in. You're not going to preach on a college campus the same way you would share the gospel in a nursing home. It, so, so, know, so know your context. Okay, the culture... I probably won't suggest doing this in great detail, but you can probably take some liberty and do this. Read books, watch movies uh, from your culture. So it provokes discussion. <coughs> Maybe you can use it in some of your illustrations in your preaching. Uh, just be careful with, with how much you're watching and what you're watching. The modern world uh, is promoting an idea. It has a worldview. It has worldviews, plural. So it also may give you compassion behind these people that you're preaching to and sharing with. All right, so application. Make sure you get you a reading calendar. Uh, if you haven't been reading through the Bible in a year, I'm going to challenge you now to start doing that. It's very, very helpful. It's a very, very good thing to do. Challenge yourself to put some memory verses. How many are you going to memorize per year? And then put a plan of action in place. Uh, 
you need to be master at knowing human nature. Okay? You need to be master, you need to master reading body language. That's your job as a preacher. That's what God wants you to do. So you're not preaching to the same people every Sunday. You're not ministering to the same sheep on Wednesday nights or visiting them in the hospitals. You're dealing with different people every single time you step up on that stool. So you have to become a master at just human nature and knowing who you're preaching to. Okay? <clears throat> oh, this is what I thought was very helpful for me. He talked about not over-talking someone, but genuinely caring about them. Um, and what I, what Dustin Seegers helped me do, I kind of sent him some of my videos at one time. And there was this one time that I was talking with an agnostic. And Dustin said, brother, I love you, but you interrupted that dude like 15 times. He said, you over-talked him. He said, uh, shut up. <laughs> he said, listen to the guy. And I needed that. I needed Dustin to kind of get a little hard on me and, and because I was over-talking the guy. So... But there's a difference between someone having a genuine question and talking and dialoguing with you versus someone mocking you and ridiculing you and giving you 15 questions within 20 seconds, okay? That's a mocker, and I'll call them out. You're just a mocker. You don't want to know the truth. You hate God. But I'm here so people can, who truly who want to hear truth and want to know truth can actually hear. So don't be hesitant to call somebody out, but at the same time, listen to someone. Genuinely care about them. Here's some communication questions I have learned to ask over the past year or two. So if someone's talking and they won't be quiet, I'll simply say, hey, can I interrupt for a moment? Can I ask you a question for a second? And I'll ask them the question to kind of guide the conversation to see if they'll shut up and allow me to get a word in edgewise. Or ask a clarifying question. Hey, can I interrupt for a minute? Can, can you clarify something? You said something about 20 seconds ago. What do you mean by that? And just give what they what you want clarification of. And sometimes you just got to interrupt. Hey man, can I, can I interrupt and just add one point here? Where do you get morals for without God? Or, or whatever you may, but preface it with, hey, can I just interrupt for a moment? And try to be respectful that way. Okay? Try to apply for the, for, uh, the we talked about four study habits. Okay? We talked about the short periods of time doing a mindless task, giving yourself an hour read time, and a quiet day once a month. Maybe you can't apply all four, but try to apply at least two. Just try to start with two. So short periods of study, giving your mind some time to be creative, so mindless task. Every day read for an hour, giving yourself a quiet day once a month. Just try it. See if it'll work for you. Okay. And last but not least, keep your pulse on your schedule. If you don't keep control of your schedule, your schedule is going to control you. And let me tell you, it's a hard taskmaster. It is. It really is. All right. Chapter 6, prepping a sermon. All right. Preaching, content, people, culture. Here we go. You meditate on the text. You read the text. You read the text. You read the text. You read the text. You keep reading the text. My, my professor, my taught hermeneutics, he said, I don't want any of you young people leaving this classroom and preparing a sermon and have not read the text in ten different versions. Ten different versions, that's pretty hard. Not, not counting the New World Translation now. <laughs> or the New Living Translation. But ten reliable, ten translations of the text. Here's a scripture, Luke 2, 18 through 19. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. And Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in their heart. So as you're preparing to preach a text, if you've meditated on it, and you're chewing on it, and you're thinking about it, and you've read it and reread it and reread it, and ask God to show you what's in the text, you're going to be ready to preach. Okay? Prayerfully study and talk about what God showed you the last time you went through the text. Uh, so I'll give you an example of that. I had to preach from a, the text of Scripture, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Great text to preach on, by the way. And I prepared, I prepared, and I, the morning before I preached, I read through the text one more time, and I said, Lord, have I missed anything? Can you sh I know I probably missed tons, but Lord, 
is there anything you want me to see from the text today that I need to share with the people? And there was a phrase, much more. And it showed up three times in about five verses. So Paul was communicating a point. Much more we're saved from God's wrath. Much more we're saved through God reconciling us. More that God started the work of salvation. So I really brought those points out in the text. That God, we've been saved from God's wrath through Christ. God has reconciled us through Jesus. And finally, that God started the work of salvation. Okay, And the, the, those phrases brought those three points out very clearly. So spend time praying over the text, thinking about the text. Let the text provide its structure. The text will break out in a nice little structure as you begin to pray over it and read over it. You'll see it, it will begin to unfold and it will begin to lay out real nicely for you. Just let the text provide its structure for you. I mean, so Romans 5, 6 through 11, for me, the text broke out real easy. 6 and 7 was, what's the, what's the problem? 7 and 8, no, 8 and 9 was, what was the solution? 10 and 11 was what God did. So I just kind of, and, and no, I mean, if you're going in to, to speak to, to some really sharp minds, you're not going to speak to them the same way you speak with someone who is maybe not educated or not as educated as the other person. But anyway, so develop, let, let God's text develop that structure within itself. Um, also, he challenged, and I don't do this a lot anymore, but I used to when I had time. Maybe I need to look at my calendar, right? <laughs> Write your message out. It helps develop new ways of saying things. So when you, before you preach a message, write it all out. I know that's a lot of work. But, hey, type it up. Because as you're typing and working with the message, when you're working with the text, maybe God will give you a new way to say something that you never thought about before. I know that in the discipline of writing, and all of us, if we're evangelists and Christians, you need to be writing. I'm going to say it again. You need to be writing. If you're not blogging, put something on Facebook that has content that you've written about God, about theology. It benefits people. And it helps you become a better writer and a better thinker, okay? This is good stuff right here. Read yourself full. Think yourself clear. Pray yourself hot. And then let yourself go. I'll say it again. This is Stott. This is not me now. Probably Stott or Mark, Mort Lord Jones. I can't, I didn't write down who it was. But read yourself full. Think yourself clear. Pray yourself hot. And then let yourself go. All right? The content, what should, you should be, what, what should be your content? The usage of words rightly placed is like a surgeon's blade. A word rightly placed at the right time can cut to the heart. I lo- I'm not a big Mark Twain fan, but guys, this made me chuckle. All right, here we go. The difference between the right word and the nearly right, Mark Twain says, is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. <laughs> That's pretty good, isn't it? The difference between the rightly placed word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. The Bible is full of good illustrations. This is kind of it, when I was reading the book, I was like, bam, oh, this is awesome. Yeah, goodness, why have I forgotten about this? I don't have to come up with new illustrations. The Bible is full of illustrations. Use them, okay? Have an ending, have an, wait and save your. Writing your intro and your conclusion to the very end. Get the meat of your text first. Get the meat of your sermon first, okay? Talk about the issues going on in the culture. So application, pray and read the text before you shoot off in the open air, okay? Pray with the text read. We need to treat open air preaching, like I said earlier, with the reverence that we treat pulpit preaching. All our illustrations and cultural points should drive home one dominant thought. The cross, the gospel. We're always getting them back to that point. So everything we're doing... It has one dominant thought, has one dominant theme. That is the redemptive work of the cross of Jesus Christ. Don't forget that. Challenge yourself to write on a subject. Communicate better. Challenge yourself. All right, two chapters left. Chapter 7, sincerity, sincerity and earnestness. Under the preaching. Make sure when you preach that you really believe what you're preaching. The lost can tell a phony a mile away. Okay, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. But anybody who's listening to this later on, they can smell a phony 
a mile away. I had a guy came up to me, and this is just God's grace, okay? The young man came up to me, and I think it was an NBL All-Star weekend. He said, man, I don't believe what you believe. He said, but I believe that you do. Man, I was, I was almost weeping. Just inside, I was just jumping for joy because I had at that moment conviction and passion. And the young man could tell that, man, this guy really does believe this, okay? A man can't only preach, he must also live. Sign the Prince of Preachers there, okay? So we can't just preach the Word. We have to be the example of the Word. Four major things that they need to see in your preaching, they need to hear in your preaching. You need to be real. You need to be sincere. You need to be you. You need to be natural. And you need to be earnest. Don't try to imitate the next guy. That's not you, Paul Harvey. That's not you, John. That's not you, Bobby. That's not you, Andy. That's not you, Scott. That's not you, Bill. It's not me, Tommy. Be who you are. That's who these people need you to be. They need you to be led by the Spirit of God, God taking your personality and using, using you for His glory. Content. Such a work as preaching for men's salvation should be done with all our might that the people can feel us preach when they hear us. My goodness, that was written by Richard Baxter, the Reformed pastor. If you haven't read that, you need to pick it up and read it also. It's on page 278. I'll read it again. Such a work as a preacher for men's salvation should be done with all of our might that the people can feel us preach when they hear us. Okay? I love this. This is from Martin Lloyd-Jones. Okay? Preaching is theology coming through a man who is on fire. That's all preaching is. Sound the, hopefully sound theology. If not, we'll pull you off the stool with a hook. Sound theology coming through a man on fire. Uh, some people he talked about in this chapter of sincerity and earnestness are people like the Apostle Paul. He even talked about Billy Graham and D.L. Moody. And I went back on purpose this week and I listened to about, 50, no, about 10 minutes of one of Billy Graham's old sermons in 1958. His theology is wacky in areas, and it's really heretical, some of the stuff he says was when he got older. But man, those ten, that 10 minutes I listened, he was a firecracker. I mean, he was passionate, and he was earnest, and he was sincere. Uh, Stott even went on to say what confounded the preachers in U the UK when Billy Graham came over is, why are they listening to him and not listening to us? And Stott came to the conclusion, well, I think it's because he was sincere. And he was very earnest in what he was doing. So, anyway, something to think about. He also talked about D.L. Moody. Here's some scripture for us to kind of back up what Stott's saying about being real, being sincere, being natural, and being earnest. Or as I have often told you before, I now tell you again, even with tears. This is the Apostle Paul saying he has tears in what he's getting ready to say. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. So in the Apostle Paul himself, he's saying he's in tears. Because why? He, there are men and women living on planet earth who live as enemies of the cross of Christ. This is why the Apostle Paul could sit in Rome as long as he did and then be presented to the Felix and the Festus and say, not only you, but everyone out here minus my chains would come to know Christ. This is the sincerity in which the Apostle Paul preached with. The natural way in which he preached, the realness that came from him, the earnestness in his preaching that came out. Okay, application points are pretty straightforward. I want you to be real. I want you to be sincere. I want you to be natural. I want you to be earnestly pleading for men's souls, pleading for people, pleading in clarity for people to come to know Jesus. Okay? Spurgeon said, you must be interesting yourself before you will be interested in others. Spurgeon said, be interested yourself and you will interest others. Yeah, I messed it up the first time. I'll say it again. Spurgeon said, be interested yourself in the Bible, in the Holy Book, in the Holy Scriptures, and then you will interest others because you have spent time. Fire inside will put fire outside. All right. Finally, the last chapter, Courage 
and humility. In our preaching, I don't care about the popularity that comes with, with the popularity of being a big preacher. I, Stott would say he never ever wants you to sacrifice truth for the vain pursuit of popularity. I don't think any of us struggle with that. And I pray, I hope if we ever do, that one of us will call each other to the carpet on it and go, Brother, take yourself down a notch and sit down. Be humble. Don't get proud. Okay? We want to disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. I thought that was a good phrase, right? We want to be able to disturb those who are comfortable. Come by, ah, I'm good, man. No, 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 you're not good. <laughs> you're not good one bit. There's only one good name, Christ. And you need to be right with this, right with his just law through him. Okay? Humility. Pride, this is what Stott says, pride is without a doubt the chief occup, occupational hazard of the preacher. Pride is without doubt the chief occupational hazard of the preacher. Here's what the psalmist says in Psalm 131, verse 1. Oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great or too marvelous for me. So the psalmist is giving himself a great dose of humility. Okay. He says, uh, Stott says on page 332 of his book, all God's giants must be weak men. So if you want to be giant, a giant in the kingdom of God, be a weak man. Be a humble man. Be a courageous man. The culture, let me tell you what we have in our culture. We have prideful, arrogant throne stealers. Now, what is a throne stealer? This is a person who sits upon his autonomous throne and says, I am God. You give me the evidence for your little puny God. It's our job to take the throne stealers and yank them off the rightful throne that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lord, Lords belongs on and put him back on his throne. Applications for the entire uh, for this chapter, have courage to stand against the rest of the world for Christ. Even if you're the last person to stand, Christ is worth it because He's Lord, because He's Savior, because He's King, because He's the coming judge. Have the humility to be corrected, even if you have to be corrected by a five-year-old. Have that humility. I've had unbelievers come up to me before and go, that's not what that person asked. And at that moment, I had to kill my pride and go, okay, well, sir, what did he ask? <laughs> because I missed it. What did he ask? So have that humility. Okay. Summary for all the chapters here. Here's some application points from everything. Have courage be, to be humble. Be real, be sincere, be natural, be earnest. We need to treat open air preaching with the reverence that we treat pulpit preaching. Never Try not to over-talk someone when they're genuinely... Care, try not to over-talk them when they're becoming genuinely beginning to care about what you're saying, and you genuinely can care about them and to let them talk, okay? Call out the ones who are mocking at you, okay? You can ask good, good questions uh, when they're talking, and you want to kind of step in, just go, hey, can I ask a clarifying question here? Can I add a point here? Can I interrupt just for a second to try to stop their flow of thought if they're not stop, stopping talking? Uh, be about your father's business. Don't, from, don't forget to go to your corner of the harvest field and you remain faithful there. Okay? Bring the controversial questions up in the open air. I want, you to, I want us to be expositors who preach in the open air. I want us to be expositors who preach in the open air. Discussing and having dialogue, doing open air preaching is vitally important to having more people here. Bring up their objections and answer them while you're preaching. Our task at hand is to is a weighty task that should be not be taken lightly. And just like I said earlier, with this Christianity light, with this false teaching that's being preached in the world across the pulpits of Stephen Furtick and Joel Osteen and Bethel Church, God has called us men to stand in the gap and close our Lincoln Longs have now we have the foundation, we have the four corners of the house, the pillars are built, and we are bridging the gap between preaching and people through our application points. And we now can go to bed. <laughs>